Lord, I didn't invent this. I didn't dream it. You spoke it. Lord, you're doing something profound in this church. You're changing lives. You're digging. You're probing because you're getting us ready. He that hath clean hands and a pure heart will stand on your holy hill when the glory comes. Lord, the glory is coming. The glory of the Lord is coming. And Lord, we'll not be able to stand before you when that glory falls. Oh God, do a work by your spirit. Lord, we thank you for what you're doing. I thank you for what you're doing in my heart. I thank you for what you're doing in this congregation. I hear so many people say, God is changing me. The word is cleansing me. God is doing something profound in my heart, changing my home, my family, my children. God is at work. We thank you for that now, Lord. Sanctify the word in our ears to hear and my voice to speak. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Kill the weasel. A true story. There was a pastor by the name of Wilberforce who was walking one day on the island of Skye, and he noticed a golden eagle taking flight. And he was, he was, uh, deeply moved by the sight as that golden eagle circled higher and higher into the sky. And while I stand there watching this golden eagle take flight, he noticed that the flight became erratic and the wings began to flutter wildly. And suddenly the golden eagle started diving and in fact fell right near him uh, dead. And he, he had not heard a shot. There was no shot fired. And he was very curious as to what had happened to this uh, huge golden eagle. And he went over to examine it. There, were, there was no gunshot wound. There was no wound at all. And then he flipped the, the eagle over, and he suddenly recognized the, the reason for the death of the golden eagle. There clutched in his claw was a weasel. Now, a weasel is a long, thin animal a carnivorous animal that lives on rodents and birds, and it's almost like a mink, a long, thin uh, animal. The eagle had clutched it uh, further down in the body, and in flight it evidently clutched it to its breast, and the weasel had latched itself onto the breast of the eagle and sucked its blood out. And the eagle absolutely, evidently had died in flight because the weasel had drained the eagle's blood. And folks, this is an absolute vivid picture of a Christian who is endeavoring to go higher and higher in the knowledge of Christ and yet has in his hand a besetting sin, a secret sin that will absolutely detain the flight, and not only detain the flight, it's not only the weight that we're talking about here in Hebrews 12, 1, but it's also that besetting sin that will absolutely suck the lifeblood, the spiritual lifeblood out of the believer. Now, I want you to hear me very clearly. Some of you may think this is a crude illustration, but it's one of the clearest. And, and if you walk out of here... When I am finished today and you look at your besetting sin in your hand is an eagle clutching that weasel. See, he thought that was his meal. He was going to devour it. He's going to have pleasure eating that thing. And instead, it drained him and literally killed, took his life. If you have a secret lust to besetting sin, you have a weasel that is in the clutch of your hand. And if it isn't dropped, if it isn't let go of, now, the Hawk family has a, tra has a trait, and I don't know why this eagle didn't do it, but many in the Hawk family will take the rabbit or the, whatever animal that they've swooped down and picked up and will drop it on a rock and then swoop down to the dead animal and devour it. And the lesson is that that besetting sin, that thing that is still in your life that God is dealing with is that weasel in hand that will drain your spiritual life out of you. And that's where we're going with the message today. My message is a plea and a loving warning from the Holy Spirit asking you to drop your weasel on the rock. Drop your besetting sin on the rock. 
lest it devour you, and unless you kill the weasel, the weasel will kill you. It's that simple. This is exactly the warning here in Hebrews 12.1. This is a very familiar verse. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin that does so easily beset us. Now, that verse sounds almost leisurely. It sounds nonchalant. Well, lay down your besetting sin as if when you get around to it, or when you think about it, or in time, will you please deal with your besetting sin? But that's not how the original Greek brings it out. In the original Greek, it's very strong. It says, it says in the original, original, stop it. Lay it down now, cease it, put it away from you. In other words, let go of it before it kills you. It's that strong in the Greek. And the Bible says, lay aside every weight. And this is the counsel of the Lord that says that that besetting sin has put a load on you that you can't carry. It's a load of guilt. There is not a true Christian here hearing me right now. If you have a besetting sin that you are still holding in your hand, clutching to, if that is still there, if you love the Lord, it has to produce in you a load of guilt. He said the only way to lay aside that weight, that load of guilt, is to lay the sin down. And when the sin is gone, the guilt is gone. That is the weight. It is the guilt, the fear, the condemnation that comes on a believer that is carrying that hidden thing. And folks, that, that sin that I liken to the weasel is the very thing, no matter how high, you, you may look like you're soaring into the heavens and people may admire your flight, but they don't know that you have a weight. They don't know that you're carrying something in your hand. They don't see that thing that's draining your life. You can look like a Christian. You can look like an overcomer. You, you can have all of the outward appearance of being an eagle. And the Bible in Isaiah, the 40th chapter, I think in the 35th verse, talks about our walk with God or our, our, our uh, being with Christ is uh, taking wings as an eagle, having wings as an eagle flying into the heavenlies. And you can be flying in the heavenlies, soaring above everybody else, enjoying the knowledge that you're getting in. You can be enjoying your Christian walk. But if you have that weasel in your hand, it's going to get to your breast. And it's going to drain your spiritual life little by little until there is spiritual death. I'm not talking about damnation of the soul. I'm talking about spiritual death here and now. I'm talking about the here and now. David said, because of his sin, there's no soundness in my flesh because of thine anger. Neither is there any rest in my bones because of my sin. My iniquities have gone over my head. It's a heavy burden. They're too heavy for me now. I am troubled. I'm bowed down greatly. I go mourning all the day long. I am feeble. I'm sore broken by reason of the disquietness of my heart. And he said, I'm so broken I can't even look up. You see, because he, he had this thing in his hand and it was draining his life. This, this lust that was in David's heart, this sin that was in David's heart, it was absolutely draining him. Until he says, my bones are broken, I can't even look up, I've got a heavy burden I can't carry. And folks, when there is sin in the life of a Christian, it is an unbearable burden. The load of guilt and fear and condemnation and how it, how it just sucks the joy, how it drains the life blood out of an overcoming, a Christian who should be living overcoming. There are countless numbers of Christians, however, who carry no guilt whatsoever. They, they don't, the, the scripture, they can't apply to themselves. It says lay aside every weight and their sin doesn't even be such because they've made peace with their sin. They don't see it's wrong because they got tired of resisting it. And what they finally did, they found a doctrine of perverted grace that enabled them to live with their sin comfortably. And at one time, they had the conviction of the Holy Ghost. At one time, God dealt with them of their sin. But they got weary of it. They got cozy with their sin. And they began to just you know, hold it to their breast, so to speak. That weasel is taken into the breast. 
And now they, they, they can go about without any guilt or any condemnation whatsoever. They forget what Paul said in Titus about the grace of God. The grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared to all men. Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. We're to live godly. The grace of God is to produce godliness and holiness in us. Now, follow me closely. You're, you're going to see something in the realm of the Spirit that I, I, I hope and pray will bring absolute deliverance to you this morning. Moses spoke of a people who would refuse to forsake their sins, but he said they would claim to have a peace. It's a false peace, but they would claim that they're in peace. That's in Deuteronomy 21, 19. This person will say he will bless himself in his heart, saying, I shall have peace, though I walk in the imagination of my heart to add drunkenness to thirst. And the Hebrew, the original Hebrew Bible says, I shall have peace, though I walk in the stubbornness of my heart and gratify all my appetites. I have peace. I'm a Christian. I'm under the blood. I'm the righteousness of Jesus. I can satisfy all my appetites. I don't care if I walk in the stubbornness of my sin. I have peace. Folks, there's no greater peace than in a graveyard. And here's a man that's having his very spiritual life sucked out of him. He's got this thing draining him and about to destroy him. And he says, I have peace. Though I walk in the stubbornness of my own heart. And folks, there are thousands of Christians living in a false world of false peace. And what a day when they stand before the Lord. What a day. I used to think that Christians who sinned willfully and stubbornly would always have have this guilt, but some do not because they have shaken it off. They don't even know that they're weighted down. They're loaded down and weighted down with sin and can't recognize it. And how do you put off something you don't even recognize? And I want to talk to you about what the Bible calls mortification. Mortification. Would you go to Romans 8 chapter, please? Romans 8. You still there? Romans 8, verses 12 and 13. Romans 8, I still hear the leaves rustling. Are you there? Romans 8, verse 12 and 13. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh, to live after the flesh. For if we live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify, means put to death the deeds of the body, ye shall live. Listen to me. Look this way. If ye, through the Spirit, do mortify or kill the weasel, ye shall live. If ye, through the Spirit, do mortify the deeds of the flesh, ye shall live. The word mortify actually means to draw the life out and to deaden it, weaken it until it's dead. You, you keep working on it by faith and working on it, and that besetting sin becomes weaker and weaker and weaker until finally the thing lies without life. It has no lifeblood. Now, I want to stop here right now and tell you I, why I believe God so hates uh, sin. Why is it that God wants to kill the weasel. That weasel is your besetting sin. Let me explain something to you. Boy, the Holy Ghost put this in my heart yesterday, and I, I just had to put my hands up and rejoice and, 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 and praise the Lord. I said, Lord, I never saw it before. And it, it, puts, it puts God's hatred towards sin in a whole new light. You see, it's not because sin... It is the work of his arch enemy, Satan. It's not just because it's the work of the devil that angers God. It's not because sin embarrasses God, because he's beyond that. It's not even because God is holy that he so hates sin. Yes, there's a hatred towards sin, but it's, it's not, as, as sin 
in itself and as such, but it is the results of sin. It is what sin, it's not what sin does to him. It's what sin does to his children. It's what sin does to his people. It's the wages of sin. It's the consequences of sin that so angers God. And I'm going to open that to you, hopefully by the power of the Holy Spirit here in just a few moments. Jesus, it is written, came to give life. In him was life, the Bible says. God sent his own son to produce life in his people. Folks, this whole thing is about life. It's life. God sent Jesus that you and I might have life as believers, not only life, but abundant life. Abundant life. And God will not sit by and allow anything, any hindrance, any demon, any devil, any hindrance, any flesh to suck out and drain the life that his son died to provide. If God didn't act against your sin and mind that drains us of that life, he would just be despising the sacrifice of his own son. Are you seeing it? Do you hear in the spirit? Jesus came to produce life. He never intended that his people go around walking in fear and condemnation and guilt and under the thumb of the enemy or the dominion of sin. Why does God hate the weasel? Because it drains the life out of us that Jesus died to provide. Jesus said, I stand at the door and knock, and he wants communion. He wants to come and sup. And he knows that that thing shuts the door to communion. Because when Adam sinned, he hid from the presence of the Lord. You think God was mad at just because he sinned? No, it was more than that, because it's the result of sin. It broke that sweet communion. And folks, if you're a true Christian of Jesus with all your heart, you know what happens when you sin before God. And when you keep falling into the same old sin and you know how you stand before the Lord, you feel the guilt and you feel the pain and you know you've injured the Lord. And, and, and th th this, the Lord looks at you and says, look what it's done to you. It's robbed you of the life. It's robbed you of the joy. It's robbed you of my peace. And the Lord will stop at nothing to get at that sin to bring back the life. To produce the life because that's what he wants. He's not trying to chastise you just because you made him angry. That's not where the anger of God is. The anger of God is against the pain and the walls that have been erected by sin. That's where his anger is directed. God's not mad at you. He's not mad at any of his children. God has never once in the history of mankind passed away or forsaken one of his children that struggles against sin, hating his sin. He may not have the victory, but God will never cast you aside. He is still your loving father. But I tell you, he will stop at nothing, absolutely nothing, until he gets to that weasel and kills it because he knows it stands between you. It has the potential of draining you of every ounce of spiritual life that Jesus died to provide. Folks, let that sink in a minute. You see, he's not mad at you. He's not at, mad, mad at me. He looks down and sees a poor struggling saint struggling against the besetting sin. And he says, oh, my poor child, look what it's done to you. Look what it's doing to you. You don't even want to come into my presence. You don't want to even pick up the book. You feel so unworthy. And now look what it's doing to you, the pain and, and the shame. And, and now the rivers are closing up and drying because you you are having your life drained out of you. Your life is being drained out. Sin is draining this life out of you. He says, now come. Let me help you. Let me bring you to deliverance. And folks, that's when the life 
of Jesus Christ. And Paul the Apostle gave his very life, gave his very life for this one reason, that the promise of life in Jesus Christ may be fulfilled. Second Timothy 1.1, 1, 1, the promise of life in Christ Jesus. Beloved, this whole struggle against sin, this whole battle of sin, why is it that God raises up shepherds, uncompromising, who stand in the pulpit and come against sin and hold it to your face? Why does God send prophets? Why does he speak through his word in such power and anointing? And why does he come and hammer like a hammer? His word hammers and hammers. It's not God trying to pound you down. It's not God trying to be justified. It has nothing to do with the justice of God even. It cannot affect the justice of God. He will be just in his own nature. But he does that out of love. I, we had a pastor call our office this week. And demand immediately to be taken off my mailing list. He had read a message called, uh, they have taken away the cross. And he didn't like the part about the cross confronting sins. He said, that's all settled. He didn't like it at all. And, and, and I, he probably uh, believes in his heart that I'm just a legalistic sin stomper. So take me off your list. I don't want any of that kind of hard language. Let me tell you what the Holy Ghost showed me. And listen. The man of God who stands before you and warns you of a weasel in your hand that can destroy you is the preacher of life. He is preaching of life. Why, why would anybody... Why would anyone stand in the pulpit when he knows human nature, when he knows the spirit of this age, and when he knows that many of his people are, are, are wallowing in sin and the Holy Ghost is talking about that sin? Why would anybody allow us to, oh, go ahead and pet your weasel, pet it. You can't pet sin. You can't put boundaries on sin because sin always overflows its boundaries. You can't say, I'll go this far and that's as far as I'll go. There are no boundaries. Sin always overflows its boundaries. It's about life. When the Lord began to put this message in my heart, I said, well, Lord, the last five messages have all been about sin. The Lord says, no, David, you're not saying this is about grace. This is grace. This is God saying, I want a people full of life. I don't want my people dragging anymore. I want people with joy and victory in their heart. I want them to live in peace. It's about life. That you might have life. That you might have it more abundantly. The other word for weight in Greek is hindrance. And, and that is the weasel. He said, oh, no, he will come after every hindrance. Folks, that's why just when you think it's all settled and God can't go any deeper. And he's, he's peeled the onion down to the core. Then here comes another message. Another conviction. <laughs> why? The Lord's saying, I want you to get to the place where there's absolutely nothing standing, hindering this river of life. We sing, there's a river of life springing up in me, and there is a Holy Ghost that wants to spring up in a well that begins to flow, and he wants no hindrances to block that flow of blessing and favor and anointing of the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. I can tell where there's been a church that's been under the preaching of the word where people have been sanctified by the word and cleansed by the word of God because there's a genuine worship. There's a shout in the church of victory. Hallelujah. People have the joy of the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Folks, I don't call it living. Getting up every day with a cloud hanging over the head. I don't call it living, looking in the mirror every day and wondering, is my sin going to bring some kind of judgment on me? And that's, that's where many, many people are. 
They think that way. And, and folks, the Bible does say the wages of sin is death. I don't call that living, walking around every waking hour with a load of guilt and fear and condemnation. I don't call that living at all. Not in my book. That's not living. And that's not what God wants for his people. If ye through the Spirit do mortify the flesh, ye shall live. Hallelujah. Paul speaks of those who have their understanding darkened through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness. Now look at the people he's describing. He's saying, here are people who, who are holding on to their sin. They've got this thing in their hand. These are eagles trying to fly, and they've got this thing in their hand. And he said, it's, they're walking in darkness now, and there's uncleanness with greediness. And look what the result is. Being alienated from the life of God. Alienated, cut off from the life of God. Hallelujah. Let me tell you, there have been times in my life, in my younger years in ministry, God would see me clutching a weasel. He saw something in my hand that could destroy me. And the Holy Ghost came. And he would say to me, David, let that go. It's going to drain you of your anointing. It's going to cost your ministry. It's going to bring you to a spiritual death. And you'll be useless to your generation. That's how clear it was. That's how loud it was. Because God will stop at nothing to get at that thing. Nothing. Because he will let nothing hinder the life that he wants us to have. And I thank God that that produced the fear of God in me. And I said, oh, God, take it. God, take it. And I look back and I see how he saved my life, saved my ministry, and kept my anointing so that this time in my life and in, in my latter years now, I have that river of peace and joy in my soul. Hallelujah. And I thank God for the day he spoke so strong to me. If he had just patted me on the back and said, Gee, David, I know you, you mean well. I see your tears. Folks, your tears in itself won't do it. Your promises and your vows won't deliver you. That is absolutely hopeless. You can't do it in your flesh. But all folks, if you have a heart for God, if you want to walk in righteousness, the Holy Ghost will come to you. He will send messengers. He will send prophets. He'll put shepherds before you. And he will hold your sin up in your face. Not because he's mad at you. Not because he's trying to hammer you down. But he said, I'm trying to save you. Trying to deliver you. Alienated from the life that is in God. Folks, do you want Jesus with all your heart? I say, do you want Jesus with all your heart? Well, you can't have him unless you want his life. Because in him is life, the Bible says. And you can't have Christ unless you desire his life. And you can't have his life without deliverance from the weasel. You say, Brother Dave, how, how is sin mortified? How do I kill the weasel? Through the Spirit. If ye through the Spirit do mortify, ye shall live. See, it's all about living. It's all about life. God sent the Holy Ghost into our hearts to do the work of mortifying sin. And I'll give you one heart, and I will put a new heart in you and a new spirit. I'll take away the stony heart out of your flesh. I'll give you a heart of, uh, I'll take the stony heart out of your flesh and will give you a heart of flesh. A new heart also will I give you and a new spirit I'll put within you and I will take away the stony heart. If you want to lay down your sin, 
Folks, when I began to pray about this this past week, I closed all my books, said, Lord, I can't get this out of a book. God, you have to show me. We've got we've got people still battling with drugs and alcohol and homosexuality and lesbianism, bitterness and gossip. And folks, I don't know what it is. I don't know what that weasel is in your hand. I don't know what you're clutching to. But I know one thing. If you have a heart for God, there's a cry in you, oh God, I want life. I want to live. I want to live now. I'm not talking about just eternal life. He said that we may have life. Have it more abundantly. The Holy Ghost will come to you. And he will speak in no uncertain terms to you. He's going to show you. No, no, I want you to follow very close. He's going to get you to focus on the danger of your condition. He will focus you on the danger of your condition. He's going to say, you have something in your hands. This is he has to me. When I was especially a young pastor and an evangelist, and God would say, you can't watch that on television. You can't, you can't do that again. You can't do that. In other words, that's, that, that's going to rob you. It's going to take it away. If there was bitterness in my heart when somebody did me wrong, God says, no, David, if you keep that bitterness another day, It's going to suck your life. It's going to rob you. It's going to destroy you. Folks, there are pastors, evangelists, and lay people all over the world right now who are spiritually dead. They walk around as spiritual zombies. No life in them whatsoever because of bitterness and things that God dealt with and they never would let it go. You say, well, how can I let it go? First of all, he shows you the danger. He's going to show you through the word. He's doing that right now through my preaching. This is how God delivers. He's going to show you in no uncertain terms. He said, you keep it up. I love you, but there's something I I cannot do. I can convict you. I can send messengers. I can tell you how dangerous your condition is. I, I can paint the picture for you. I can warn you, but you have to let it go. There's an act of obedience. God, the Holy Ghost is given to work in us, but he will not work without us. There has to be a determined act of obedience that says, God, I am sick and tired of my bondage. I'm sick and tired of the load of guilt. I have a weight on me. I want to get rid of it. I want my freedom back. And when your heart begins to cry for freedom, the Lord says you can have it, but now you can't do it in your own strength. You've made